Paloids Podcast. This is Kyle with Jeremiah and a very special guest, great writer, best known for his run on all new X-Men, Cable and the X-Force, Exo Manowar, and will soon be in your pull boxes with Hard Eyes, the man with the most romantic name in comics, Dennis Hopeless. How's it going, guys? Not too How are you bad. doing? How's it going? It is going. One of my kids got bit in the head by a dog last Thursday. I saw blood gushing out of a child's head. The most blood I've ever seen in my life. So compared to last week, this week is going great. That's terrifying. Okay. <laughs> it ended up not being that big a deal. He's fine. He was at his boxing teacher's house, and a dog that has never even growled at anyone bit him just out of the blue. And when I came into the room, because I was just waiting for them to get done with class, I rounded the corner, and my kid, who's seven, is bent over, and there's more blood on his body than I've ever seen anywhere. And so I assumed he was going to be missing, like an eyeball, nose. Turns out he just had two little holes on his forehead that he got stitched up, and all is well. Boxing class, and he comes out bloody. <laughs> you want to expect <laughs> right. the dog. Yeah, the dog won the class. I bet you're having a little trouble sleeping for the next few weeks now. It was weird because I think I was in shock, and I went into fix-it mode. Like, okay, what do we have to do? Call the doctor. Do we need to get stitches? What do we need to do? And then I was totally fine for hours, because, you know, you have to go to the emergency room. They had to clean it. They had to numb it. They did all this stuff. So, you know, we got home about bedtime, got them to bed, and in the moment my kids were asleep is when all the emotion of it hit me, and I was an absolute wreck for two days. Oh, man. Yeah. But in the moment, I was fine. So I guess that's, that's good. good. That's how you yeah, that's what you want to be. Yeah, that's great. All right. So I'll just get right into it. Dennis, what do you feel is the hardest part between writing very well-known characters, the characters that you've written for Marvel and DC, and the not as well-known, but just as beloved characters? I'm a huge fan of Valiant Universe. It's the third superhero universe. A lot of people don't realize it. And Exo Manowar is a fantastic tentpole character that you got to have quite a bit of fun with. And I really hate Troy. What do you think is the most difficult part about those two dichotomies? The hardest part about Marvel Marvel stuff and DC stuff is that there's so many years of continuity and backstory that you are likely to piss somebody off by missing something, right? Like there's some reference, there's some thing you didn't see, or in some cases, like especially like Cable, there were so many 90s X-Men comics that I would put things in the book that had happened before because it was impossible for me to have read all of the X-Men books. So that's the challenge there is like, how do you tell new interesting stories without changing the character too much and that aren't just rehashing old comics? The nice thing about Valiant is there's less of that. Like you can read all of the modern day exo stuff pretty easily the question is how much of that stuff do you want to put in like you want to make a new reader friendly you want to tell your own story there's a thing at marvel where they always say don't write comics about old comics tell new stories in both cases i guess it's a challenge of how much of that stuff to put in i mean the hardest part about valiant is it's a little bit like a punk rock label Valiant fans love Valiant and are yeah, we're a little crazy. They're super passionate. <laughs> Getting other people to check it out is a little harder because you know it's like this thing that's off the side. Like you said, people don't realize it's this great, rich superhero universe. It's been around for what, like thirty years now. Thirty um, years as of this year, yeah. That's the biggest challenge there. I think is promotional because, like you said, the universe it's great, it's interesting. The characters are three dimensional. You can do all of the stuff you could do at Marvel and DC over there. It's just like let's get eyeballs. I recently read Scarab due to you know the DC app taking forever to update. So I finally got to it, and it was a great Blue Beetle story, and I got this vibe from it. I was like, you'd be really good on Venom. So I was like, I want you to write Venom. But with that, my question is, is there any mainstream character you haven't touched that you'd like to mess with their sandbox? Guy Gardner is my favorite superhero. I grew up on that 80s Justice League International, like, blah, blah, blah stuff. Like, I think it's because of Han Solo, but I like dicks who are also heroes. And I think <laughs> I've always wanted to write Guy Gardner as... You know, like a Han Solo Green Lantern. Because of that, I've never pitched him because it's scary. Like, I don't want to mess that up. If I do that, I want it to be the greatest Guy Gardner story ever told. So one day. The other thing is, the characters that have been the most fun to write, in my experience, were often the ones I didn't expect. For instance, on Cable and X-Force, they suggested I put Domino in because it was right on the heels of Rick Remender's Uncanny X-Force run, mm -hmm. which had been like a total departure and a brand new thing. And so we were trying to bring some of that 90s flavor back in and make it a Cable book. So like, let's bring in Domino. I had zero interest in Domino. She's a character I didn't care about, that I had no thoughts on it. But that made me have to get creative with what to do with her. And now Domino is one of my favorite Marvel Universe characters. Writing her was the most fun. So it's a little bit weird because the ones you think would be the most fun are kind of challenging because they already exist as like these solid things in your head. And then the ones you don't have to do with you find it. She's like my friend and I can hear that voice in my head. Or what if I give her a fling with Colossus and make that a whole thing? Which is what I did. But yeah, it's hard. The, the characters you love the most are the hardest to write sometimes. I don't think I could do a Daredevil story if I was given the reins. I'd be too 
too scared to just mess it up. The legal part of that is hard, right? Like I'm mm. too lazy to figure out how a lawyer actually talks. That's not the kind of research that I like to do. That was always my fear. I've only written Daredevil a little bit during my Doctor Strange run, but yeah, that's always my fear is like, can I actually make this guy smart enough in the right way without having to do a bunch of research? Speaking of doing a bunch of research, since you have wrote a lot of WWE comics, who is the greatest wrestler of all time and why? Oh, it's probably Ric Flair, but my heart is with Dusty Rhodes. Oh, um, like you're a man after my own heart. You're a man after my own heart. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes should not be good. Like the man has a list. His body is terrible. Goldus is another great example. Like on paper, that sounds He's my awful. boy. He's and my it's boy. amazing. So yeah, my favorite's Dusty Rhodes. And the hard thing about that is you don't want to say The Rock. You don't want to say Stone Cold. You don't want to say Hulk Hogan just because they're boring answers. But there's a reason we remember those guys, right? Those runs, when those guys were on top, they were the greatest ever. So it's more of a Mount Rushmore situation, if we're being honest. But I give it to Dusty. Occasionally, if I get really like down on myself, I will watch Hard Times to feel better. Because that's what you need to do to feel better, is have Dusty yell at you that it's hard times. Yeah, my girlfriend doesn't care about wrestling at all and doesn't understand anything about it or why I ever liked it or anything. And I have made her watch the package they put together when he died that has all of his greatest hits in it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this, this is wrestling. I'm not sure it worked, but she likes Dusty Rhodes after that. My wife, we've been together seven years, and last year she allowed me to show her one wrestling match a year. So last year was the first year, so I showed her Bret Hart versus British Bulldog at SummerSlam 93. That's a good one. Uh, so I don't know what I'm going to do this year. I haven't decided yet, but I got to make it good. And now we're done talking about wrestling because it's making Kyle uncomfortable. <laughs> I was going to say, so yeah, since I know absolutely nothing, let me change the subject drastically. <laughs> do you prefer independent or mainstream? And mainly I'm asking that simply from the recent panels I've gone to from a ton of different conventions. Seems like a lot of writers are leaning independent. And obviously with your new book coming out, where's the preference? And if you could explain why. Yeah. I mean, there's like the creative and then there's the practical like business answer, right? Right. Marvel took really good care of me for a really long time, which is why I haven't done much creator own. I kind of snuck in the side door <laughs> at Marvel because I did a, two creator own books. The first one got done and it took five years to get the second one done. And in between there, I did a whole bunch of pitches and false starts and things that died because artists moved on. And I had this pile of work that nobody was ever going to see. And I was frustrated because, you know, my friends who were artists were getting work for hire work quicker because art is easier to sell to show people, you know, show editors. And so I put together this package of all of these dead projects. I made fake logos for them and I lied about when they were going to be published. Like I pretended like they were all coming out soon. And I sent that to Marvel and DC editors. I was like, hey, like I've got a bunch of stuff coming out next year, but I'd love to pitch you. And that's how I got into Marvel. 10 months after that, Alejandra Arbona, who was at Marvel at the time, called me and asked me to pitch. And that's how my Marvel career started. So when I started working like regularly at Marvel, I had two creator-owned books under my belt, and then a third one came out pretty quickly. And then I didn't do any creator-owned work for a decade. And then Jason Aaron and I co-wrote Sea of Stars that came out, I think it started in 2019. And that was the first time I'd really thrown myself back into creator own since the very beginning of my career, like before my career really took off. So I was really lucky and really well taken care of at Marvel for all those years. Well, then the pandemic came and Pencils Down happened. And like, I had two books that were paused and then eventually canceled. Nothing to do, no work. I was stuck at home with my kids who didn't have school and losing my absolute mind because I'd had a reason to be creative every day for a decade, you know, over a decade at that point. And now I had nothing to do. And that's really what got me in the creator own mindset again is like Sea of Stars is the only thing I had to work on. And I'm like, you know, this is really fun to write something that I own and like have these calls with Jason to figure it out and with Steven, the artist. Maybe I should, you know, dig into my dusty creator own folder where all the things that I thought about and never did anything with and get something going. Since then, the last two years, that's really been all I've been doing. Like I finished off my EXO run. I did a Suicide Squad thing and a crossover event at DC over the winter. But otherwise, my brain has been all creator own and it's a totally different world. It's a lot harder. You have to do a lot of the legwork yourself and there's a lot less money at the beginning. It all comes in the back end. So it's challenging to do, especially before you build your brand and have an audience and can guarantee that you're going to be able to keep the lights on. So that's the business answer. Like it's much easier to be a Marvel or DC creator and have them ask you to pitch things. And then, you know, a month later you're writing it and some amazing artist is drawing it than it is to put together this small business and run it that is each creator own project. That said, I've never been more creatively satisfied 
in my whole life than I have been in the last two years, just putting together these three creator own projects. It is a very different thing to create a world and create a character with a collaborator, with an artist from whole cloth and to be able to do whatever you want. And like nobody can tell you, oh, that villain's taken, you can't use it this month, or like this contradicts something from 1978. Like you don't have to mess with that at all. And there doesn't have to be 10 pages of punching in each issue. And I don't have to have Wolverine guest star to get the numbers up. Like there's a lot of different things that are cool about writing superhero comics, but like I'm doing a horror romance comic and a crime book about my parents right now. And like <laughs> those things are way more exciting for my brain, especially at this point, whatever it is, 13 years into my career, than trying to figure out how to make Spider-Man kicking someone in the head different than the last 900 times he's done it. Talk about a crossover that should happen. A horror romance and a crime book about your parents. <laughs> My parents wouldn't survive in Lupe's world for five minutes. Before becoming the great writer that you are, you and me had a very similar career path. You worked at a comic book store. I did. Uh, I did the comic book store grind for about 10 years. What was your favorite part about working at a comic book store? And what was your least favorite part? Of My favorite part was definitely opening the boxes on Wednesday morning and seeing the new comics and putting them up and, you know, getting to see everything early. And like, as a creator, the fact that I like talked to people about what they liked and didn't like about comics and the physical action of putting the stuff up and saw what sold and what didn't, it's been great. It was really interesting to figure out like what do readers connect with. Also, it's really cool to realize that like internet comic fans and real life comic book fans aren't necessarily the same. Oh, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people that spend a lot of money in comics who have never been on Twitter and talked about it, right? Which makes sense. Like I love television. I don't go argue with people about my favorite shows online at all like it's not a thing i've ever done so yeah i think that was the most interesting thing definitely about working at the shop the worst thing about working at a comic book shop this is not really answering your question but it's the truth i had to run the Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments on saturday morning gamers so, yeah gamers like are children worst. gamers yeah. were the worst thing yeah i had this one little kid would come in he'd play one game and he'd spend the rest of the time mocking me like just trying to make me angry by making fun of me, which you know I appreciated. That was funny, but that was exhausting. I had a kid. He meant very, very well, but like every day he'd come in and ask, "Why is that book so expensive? Why is that book so expensive?" And I'd have to explain like every wall book to him. And uh, when he finally like recognized a name, we had an amazing Spider-Man 38 on the wall, first appearance of Norman Osborn. He recognized the name Norman Osborn. He's like, "I want that." I was like. $550. Like, <laughs> you can't have that. And like two weeks later, his dad came in and bought it. And I was just blown away. I was like, okay, <laughs> kids like five, but all right. Yeah. I don't know. I kind of miss it. I miss having that connection with other readers because most of my comic book reading friends are other creators at this point. And we're also jaded. We read stuff for work and like the word on the street is so loud about it that you can't ignore it. And it's one of the things that's kind of fun about cons is getting to interact with fans and having them tell me like what are you reading you like my work so we obviously have stuff in common like what are you reading and what should i go check out because yeah i do miss that i miss the community of the comic book store yeah one of the best parts is when like someone's into something that you weren't into at all it wasn't even close to your radar and having that conversation to where they can kind of convince you to pick it up that was one of the most rewarding parts about working on a comic book store hands down there's lots of stuff that i picked up that i would have never even considered picking up beforehand and yeah i miss it too my comic shop likes to just put things they think I'm going to like in my pile. So there's normally like five or six extra. And I think the longer I wait to pick up my pull list, the more they think I like. <laughs> <laughs> they punish you. Yes. I don't look. When I walk in, that's it. Buy it. Whatever's there is there. Brave doing that. <laughs> Brave or just not frugal. So to change the subject slightly, it's kind of a general question. And it's more of a, just to get an idea of like how you work. And I guess as an example, when you do write, do you have background noise as far as music or just ambient sound? Or is there a place you write? Just an idea of how you work. Yeah, I thought when I had a day job, I thought as soon as I quit my job and work on comics full time and I'm a full time writer, I'm going to have this amazing office. And I did. I had an office in my old house where I'm just going to sit there and be in the creative zone all day long. And what that actually did was give me a place to avoid. Like I didn't want to be there because it was really stressful when I first started writing comics. I don't have an office at home. I don't have any set place where I sit. And I just take my laptop either to the kitchen table or to a coffee shop or somewhere else. And what I've learned is I work best with ignorable chaos. I like to sit at the bar at a coffee shop that has a bar, even an actual bar sometimes. And there's, you know, the motion of the people doing their job beyond you, but they're not interacting with you so you can ignore them. And that really helps me get into the zone kind of in my head. When I'm home, I will put on pop music for the same reason. Cause like 
bubblegum pop songs like have a beat that keeps your brain moving, but they're completely ignorable. You don't think about it. Even if you're singing, you're not thinking about the lyrics. It's not stretching you mentally. When I write, I write sort of top down. So I will break the story down by beats and then I'll figure out how many pages each one of those beats are. And then I'll do like a shorthand rough of panels on each one of those pages. Then I flush those panel descriptions out and then I write the dialogue last. So the dialogue day it has to be silent because I hear the voices in my head when I'm writing dialogue and you can't do that through Britney Spears or <laughs> whatever. So that day has to be silent. That is also the hardest day to get work done because I can't trick myself into getting into the zone. I have to actually sit down and think about and hear the voices. Once I get going, it's my favorite day. It's my favorite part of the process, but it is really difficult because yeah, like my ADHD brain desperately wants to distract itself from anything other than what I'm supposed to be doing. Which, by the way, that's why I work top-down. It's why I work the way I do, because all of those parts of the process seem like impermanent note-taking until the end. So I'm tricking myself into getting a lot of script down before it feels permanent and before I like want to avoid it and run away from it. Because early in my career, I would try to sit down and write a perfect version of each page, and that took forever. Because it turns out there's not a perfect version of each page. And the more stressed out you get and the more tired you get, the more you noodle on some nonsense that the reader's going to look at for half a second. So yeah, it's all about ignorable distraction and forcing myself into the zone for as long as possible. By the way, I don't recommend this. This is a terrible way. <laughs> it's just the only way I know how to do it because I'm a crazy person. As someone with ADHD, my brain is like, that could work, maybe. But like, my brain just went like, oh, Dennis gets an email from the editor. Why did this character say toxic six times? Yeah, that happens. Yeah, sometimes those things. <laughs> will work into but i gotta do a lettering graph later so i can pull britney spears out of anything there you go generally speaking when it comes to your independent work how do you get artists interested in your stories do you have any tips or tricks for that how did you get victor to sign on for hard eyes for example i almost never bring stories whole cloth to artists i develop stuff with artists based on what they want to do which at the beginning of my career that led to a lot of pitches that weren't really me they were just me trying to do the thing that, you know, that the artist wants to do. Later, I figured out that the best pitches and the best stories are ones that, like, there's a reason you're the person to tell that story. There's something personal, something you have to say, something you're interested in, something you're passionate about, something you've gone through. You cook into that. And it's not just like, I like G.I. Joe and I like Robocop, so this is G.I. Joe meets Robocop. Because, like, every publisher gets that pitch 10 times a day because all comic book creators are genre nerds that like the same stuff. So, like, everyone in my age group has the same inspiration. So now what I do is find out what those people are passionate about, find out what our shared inspirations are, and then figure out, okay, what do I actually have to say about this? And then we kind of like have that conversation and cook it up together. In the case of Hard Eyes, it actually spawned from a drawing that Victor did. In that period of depression I was talking about when all my work went away and COVID was happening, I was looking up old pitches that had fallen apart and like old conversations with collaborators. And Victor and I had worked together on Jean Grey at Marvel a few years before that. And I loved working with him. His art is stunning and he captures the little acting nuance in his facial expressions that is necessary for like the kind of character work that I like to do while also drawing the most gorgeous, like amazingly intricate pages. He's just like the perfect artist for the kinds of stories I like to tell. And so I'm like, oh, I wonder what Victor's up to. So I go to his Facebook page. He's in Spain, so we mostly Facebook DM. And he had just posted this image of this weirdly smiling woman with like a crazy squid backpack thing, like this crazy Lovecraftian monster behind her. I was like, that's amazing, what's that for? And he's like, oh, it's Lupe. You wanna write a story about her? And so that's like basically all we have. I had this character, wow. this idea, this notion that he wanted to draw. So I used that and what I was going through personally and my thoughts on like loneliness and mental illness and like being trapped in a world and getting in your own way and all these different things that I was thinking about at the time. And that's where Hardest came from. So it's equal parts stuff that Victor wanted to draw in this character idea that he had. And then like where my mental state was at the time based on personal stuff and where the world was and COVID and everything else. And it all kind of cooked together into the stew that became Hard Eyes. Well, you let us read Hard Eyes early. It was really just fantastic. I love Apocalypse. And I think we're in the midst of starting our own here in the real world, but <laughs> I love it. And it, it was refreshing and somehow just perfect the way it flowed and there's a love story there but i'm sure you've done it a hundred times already but if you could give your little synopsis for us to share with everybody of hard eyes yeah it's actually a really hard book to elevator pitch but i have gotten better at it i think 
yeah, it's like a post-apocalyptic Romeo and Juliet. These two young people meet sort of inexplicably on the road that no one's supposed to be on because humans have to hide underground because of these crazy Lovecraftian monsters that eat your sanity that have taken over the world and destroyed human civilization. And so you don't meet people. Like people survive in pockets of whoever they ended up with. And this kid meets this girl and it's the first time he's seen anyone his age or that he could possibly be interested in in years. Like he just sees his family. And to him, she is like everything he's ever wanted. And like he's falling in love with her and she's amazing. But all his family sees is like a manic pixie nightmare come to eat them all. And so that's where we start. That's the first issue. And that's what I have to pitch because the book goes so insane starting with issue two and heads in all sorts of crazy directions. But yeah, at its heart, it's a love story. And these two characters meeting at the end of the world and trying to figure out how to be together. That being said, in the state of the world right now, I would totally be with Rico's family. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh yeah, and they're not necessarily wrong. Right? <laughs> right. Like, it's insane that she was alone and alive, and there's obviously something going on there. But also, Rico's grandfather points out at one point, like, the kid's got to live a life. Like, you can't protect can't him. Can't forever, yeah. Right, forever. He's growing up. And that's one of the most interesting things, I think, about Rico is he's alive because his family kept him alive, right? He was a kid and the most vulnerable. So all of their energy was kept into keeping him alive. All of their rules are based on keeping him alive. And now he has an opportunity to break those rules and be a teenager and go start his own life. And <laughs> no one wants that to happen because, you know, before they had those rules, people died. Gestures wildly right. at the world. Yeah. So Hard Eyes is coming out through Vault. And I was curious why you chose to bring it out through Vault as opposed to like Boom or Image or Aftershock or any of the independents. I spent so many years mostly doing Marvel work and they kept my plate full that I hadn't really, like I had pitched things intermittently, but I hadn't really looked around at the landscape of publishers. So when I started developing these two creator-owned books that I'm working on, I kind of just wanted to see what was out there. So I saw Michael Marici's Barbaric book was amazing. It looked really good. And Vault's promotion on that was mm -hmm. amazing. And then Alex Packnagel was doing a book through Vault that he was promoting. And I know Alex a little bit. So I reached out to him and asked him, like, you know, all of Vault's stuff that I've seen looks amazing. What's your experience been? And he said, they're awesome. They absolutely take care of you. They promote everything really well. Like, really big fan. You should reach out. And then he put me in touch with Adrian. And fortunately, Adrian was a fan of my Spider-Woman run. So he was super interested in hearing what we had to say. So I at that point, we had put together the hard eyes pitch, pitched it to Adrian. Everything he said in response to it was exactly what I was thinking. So it was just like the obvious home for it. And it has worked out exactly like Alex said, like Fold is amazing. They're really careful with their line, like they curate everything. Somebody called them the other day on Twitter, the A24 of comic. And I feel like that is exactly like the thing they have in common is that they're all kind of off kilter and they're all really, really good. So it's a great home for the book. Rush has been really, really good as well. Literally everything that I've read from them so far has blown me away. From just one issue, I mean, there's a vast world there. And now I'm excited for issue two because it's apparently going to get crazier. But <laughs> yeah. my question is, with the personalities there, was there any inspiration? Like you mentioned before, your parents are going to be in a, a crime comic. Was there anyone in your life that kind of inspired any of the characters? Not really. Like, not anyone specific. The characters are much younger than me. So it was more like remembering what it is to meet someone and fall for them and be completely blinded to the obvious red flags and the obvious problems. You know, when you're dating, when you're older, you immediately are like, okay, I've been to therapy. Like, I know what mental illness is. <laughs> Let's see what all of the potential problems here. And But when you're young, oh, this person's amazing. Like, we like the same stuff. This is great. And I wanted to play with that, but also play with the idea that everybody, even in our world, everybody's a little bit broken. Everybody's a little messed up from their childhood. And making a relationship work, even a new one, requires a lot of workarounds and feeling each other out. And you don't get to do that when the world is ending, right? So it was more like, oh God, COVID and the political landscape are making everything about life way harder. And they're making all of the structures and the routines fall apart and making us realize that like, just getting through a day is hard without all this stuff we hang it on, right? And I wanted to take a love story pile on with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just put more on top. <laughs> right. So you're working with Victor Baez again. You worked with him when you run on Jean Grey. What's it like working with him independently versus working with him with Marvel? Obviously, Marvel has their hands in the pot a lot. Is it been like such a great freedom with this? Or is it just like the same bike ride, just a brand new bike that's way better? It's actually really similar in a lot of ways because Victor is really communicative and likes to talk through things, which I learned on Jean Grey. He would get a script and then he'd send me a DM through Facebook and be like, 
okay, what's this about? I don't understand this. Or like, I really like this. Can I move this around? Whatever. So we had a very back and forth communicative relationship there, which doesn't necessarily always happen at Marvel because, you know, it is kind of top down. The editor controls a lot of that. So unless the creators decide to talk, they don't have to. So that part has been really similar. What's great about it is Victor likes to take his time. Victor does a lot of research. He does a lot of perspective work. Like all of his pages, all the perspective is perfect. And he like builds rooms and stuff to make sure the backgrounds are intricate, which is why you get these amazing cutout pages where he like does a three quarter view cutout of like looking at the underground and stuff. It was amazing. And on Jean Grey, it was a challenge because the book Victor wanted to do, he couldn't do monthly. And so there were a lot of great fill-ins, but fill-ins who came in to help us out with that. With Hard as we were able to build in a lot of lead time so Victor can throw his whole self into the book and do every issue and still have it come out monthly. So that's been the best thing is to have, yeah, that time freedom. And then also, we're not beholden to anything. Like we're making this world up. What I see in my head is always like half as cool, if that, <laughs> what Victor puts on the page. And that's the fun thing about like the Lovecraft stuff all comes from him. Like mm -hmm. I think Lovecraft stuff is cool, but Victor's really into cosmic horror and really into Elder Gods and stuff. So the crazy monster stuff that happens later in this book is all just like bleeding out of his weird head and super exciting to get those pages. In. Talking about Victor, the three-dimensional kind of thing, that sewer scene that immediately jumped in my brain. I was like, how the hell did he think of that? It was like the most captivating page. The reason I knew he could do that, and the reason I asked for that, is in Jean Grey, we have a scene where Hope and Jean Grey are talking in like an abandoned building. They're just having a conversation, and then beneath them is a bunch of reavers in a reaver hive that are like running up the stairs to get to them, and then there's a big fight. And in my mind, I was asking for like a Jack Kirby straight on cutout where like, you know, you see them and you see straight down. But Victor cut it out and drew it in three quarters. So it's the coolest double page spread that's ever been in anything. And so, you know, that's why I asked him for that river walk scene and then I asked him to do it again and he said please don't ever ask me for this again these things take so long and he's like I really don't want this to be my trademark because I don't have to do it anymore now does Hard Eyes have an end or is it going to be an ongoing for as long as possible this story ends in issue five the world there's a lot of stuff we could do so if it sells really well we'll probably do more but hopefully yeah, yeah. I got a little bit of a fun question now so let's say that your apocalypse is happening for real you can only pick from comic creators who is your survival squad I mean most of us are dead I'm definitely <laughs> dead. I don't know, though. My kid was bleeding from the head the other day, so maybe I would be fine, and then I'd just cry as soon hey. as everybody went to sleep. Todd Ribic is the scariest person in terms of that <laughs> in comedy. I love that. He's a sweetheart, but, like, I would not mess with him. He has amazing stories about his time in the Army that make you think, like, he would just kill us all if he wanted to. He's definitely someone I would want on my team. Beyond that, yeah, we're screwed. Like, we sit and type for a living mostly. And the artists have, like, a really physically demanding job, but it's one that breaks their backs. Like, all my artist friends have, like, <laughs> back and hand problems. So other than that, I don't, I don't know. I think we'd all be screwed. Looking at Jason Aaron, he looks like a tough son of a bitch. And then when he talks, he's so soft-spoken. Yeah, Jason's a good friend of mine. He lives here in Kansas City. And I think that is why he looks tough. Because, yeah, he's a cotton candy man. He's just so sweet and so nice and would never hurt a fly. But, Southern Bastards was so good. <laughs> yeah, his brain is twisted yeah. and dark and broken. But, no, he's a nice guy. And he would die immediately. I'm sorry, Jason, but you would die immediately. The actually most important question that we have to ask is, uh, why is cheese no longer longer part of your life <laughs> so i have a tattoo of cheese and one of my first tattoos is cheese under my arm and i got that because i love cheese as a child like cheese was my favorite snack and cheese was really important to me and uh, right after my kids were born i went and got at the time the only physical i'd had in my adult life because i've always been a freelancer and it turns out I have a genetic cholesterol condition that makes it so that dairy was rapidly clogging my arteries. Yeah, I was told if I didn't change my diet and go on this medication, I was going to have a heart attack by the time I was 40. And Ooh. I'm now 41, so I don't get to eat cheese because I want to be alive for my children. <laughs> So that's what that means. It's a joke because, yeah, for years I always put cheese on everything. And then all of a sudden I couldn't eat it. So I didn't want to remove cheese from like my bio. So that's where that came from. Outside of Heart Eyes, is there anything else you're working on? Anything you can hint at? Maybe you're not supposed to tell us that you'd like to tell us or anything you'd like to promote. And then, of course, one final Heart Eyes promotion. Anything you could share. Well, let's see. What am I working on? Like I said, there's a crime book about my parents that's going to be coming out at some point. That one's actually really far along in the production. But where we're doing it, they wait until you're completely done to start promoting it. So I don't even know when it will come out. Sometime soon. And then I've got a Mad Cave Studios graphic novella. I'm working on what I'm bad with names of collaborators I've never spoken to aloud, but I think it's Yoder Kowalski is the artist on that. 
And uh, yeah, it's like a space thriller set on a space station thing that we've been working on for the last couple of years. So that's almost done. I think that's coming out soon. And then I'm cooking up some stuff with DC and I got another creator own book coming up, but so much of my energy lately has been on getting Hard Eyes out and promoting it that yeah, I'm just starting to get the other stuff a little further along. So in terms of Hard Eyes, I will be doing a local signing here the day it comes out, which I think is August 17th at Elite Comics in um, Johnson County, Kansas. I'm not sure if it's Overland Park. I think so. And then that weekend, I'm doing a signing at Third Eye Comics in Annapolis, Maryland. So I love that store. Love both of those stores. Doing that. Otherwise, yeah, just really hope people go ask a retailer for Hard Eyes. Vault is an amazing company. Like I said, they're really good at at everything, but they're also kind of new and not every comic shop will order heavy on vault books unless you ask for it. Like the best way to help out creators you like or books that look cool is always, always, always go tell your retailer. So please, if the book looks cool to you, which it has to because Victor's Art's incredible and our production team is incredible, go tell your retailer. And where should everyone follow you? I am Hopeless Dent on Twitter, Dennis Hopeless Comics on Instagram, Dennis Hopeless Comics on TikTok if you want to see the video trailers I made for Hard Eyes and other nonsense. Those are the best three places to find me these days. I have a podcast that we need to get back to called Missouri Swagger with Colin Bunn and Kyle Strom. So if you want to go see that stuff, it's on YouTube. And yeah, that's it. All right. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on Panelized Podcast. I absolutely think Hard Eyes is amazing and I'm so stoked for issue two. I'm kind of upset we got to read issue one early now because it just means I have to wait even longer in anticipation. But thank you again. Great work. I'm excited for everything you got coming out. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. It was fun. my profession i have to ask people like a health survey kind of at the beginning and i always ask if anyone is allergic to anything i had this one woman stare me down after i asked she said after my third pregnancy i became allergic to potatoes (laughs) my heart broke i would get rid of the child like i would blame that child forever yeah i can't eat dairy i can't eat red meat if i have too much like processed sugar it's a problem so like i can eat sweets but not that much and it used to be i didn't eat them very often and i could like cheat sometimes and have them like my doctor told me to live a little but it turns out if you stop eating those things your body forgets how to process them so now it is not worth it to try to eat dairy yeah but if i couldn't eat potatoes i might just kill myself because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the french fries that's my advice Boundless podcast. Do you know the company Boundless? Yes. Okay. So Boundless and Avatar Press, not the most PC comics in the world. No. I had a pull lister who got every cover possible of your issue. And Kyle, if you don't know this company, they're mostly like porn comics. Uh, And most of the books are $4.99, $5.99 price point. They're not your $2.99, $3.99. They're expensive. So it's expensive for a comic book store to get in. He doesn't show up for a week and it's like 20 books. He doesn't show for two weeks. It's like 50 books. So after a month, I was like, I got to stop pulling for this guy. So I finally stop. And a a month later, his friend comes in. He's like, can I get Zach's books? And I was like, sure. Is he doing all right? He's like, oh, no, he's dead. And yeah, that was a a shocking revelation. But yeah, it was like $2,000 worth of comics that was just sitting in a pull box. So don't be delinquent, Kyle. Yeah, that might be an after credit story. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great story. Panelized podcast. I was working at a comic book store one time and we were ordering like 10 copies of wwe because no one was interested this is a one in 50 right so issue five that store still has like 40 copies of (laughs) wwe number five they did really well with those variants what sucks is i would take them to shows and they sold pretty well and i had a short box that i kept inside my like carry-on suitcase it fit perfectly inside that had all of the first two art specialty covers like that and i could sell them for like 50 bucks a piece at mm-hmm. con. And I had my banner stand, which looks a little bit like a gun case. And I had them in my car outside of my apartment at the time. When I got home from a con, it was like late when I got home, so I just went inside. And a homeless person looked through the window and saw a suitcase and what looked like a gun, broke my window out and stole them. Yeah. To him, that was a bunch of useless paper. To me, it was like $800 worth of comic books to, and a $200 banner stand. To make uh, it slightly worse? <laughs> Yeah. Those variants are now like 100 to $200 a piece. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah. They ended up in the river, I'm sure. 